Hey guys and welcome back to another video. This is another episode of Android News, this time for November 2024. In this format, I will always summarize the most important news that really affect us Android developers from the past month, so from October 2024. And I can already say, this episode will be really positive. There are a lot of amazing changes on both to Android, to Kotlin multi-platform, to Compose multi-platform, so you can be excited. And by the way, until Sunday, you can still secure the early bot offer for joining the mobile dev campus, which I've just launched. So if you want to stay up to date, if you want to be rewarded for learning coding, if you want to get direct access to me and my team, check the link down below. It's all written there. Starting off with Kotlin version 2.0.20. So a new Kotlin version is out and the most important changes are on the one hand that the data class copy function will now have the same visibility as the constructor of that data class. So we can, for example, make constructors in Kotlin classes private and that means we can only invoke them from within the class we, we are actually working with. And since data classes automatically override the copy function to just provide a copy of, of this instance, this copy function will now have the same visibility as the constructor. So if the constructor is private, then the copy function will be private as well. Um, same for protected, for public, and so on. And another change is that context receivers in Kotlin will slowly be migrated to so-called context parameters. So context receivers were a, a quite a cool new language feature which won't be followed in the form um, it was it was thought of before because this feature got some community feedback there was apparently um room for improvement so jetbrains actually decided to do it a bit differently and this new context parameters feature um, goes in a very very similar direction as context receivers to just provide a function direct context on where it's called in for example you can write a function that it can only be called from within the view model and then you can automatically have access to things like view model scope inside that function without having to put it inside of a view model like the function declaration but this new context parameters feature is still in a very early phase um so jetbrains says it's uh, it's in the designing phase but i think we can expect some cool demos in future there is a proposal on github how this uh, context parameters feature could look like it's in the end quite similar to how context receivers were meant to be but puts more emphasis on things like actual parameters so i'm having actual um, fields and variable names without actually just defining the type of class that we want to provide context on but that's really just a proposal from the community um, so the future will tell what JetBrains will make out of that. Next change is that KTOR version 3.0 was released and that is now stable. And the most important changes are, on the one hand, that KTOR 3.0 now uses uh, Kotlin version 2.0. It switches to the uh, Kotlin XIO library, which is based on OKIO. So that's a library from Square that just makes working with data streams easier. And this just helps Kato to significantly improve the performance of network requests of streaming WebSocket data. It now also supports server sent events. So that's pretty much the opposite of an HTTP request where the client actually pulls data from the server with a server sent event. The server just pushes new data to the client when it's available without the client actually being able to request that. And then there are also WebSockets, which were already supported, which is a bi-directional connection. So where both the client and the server can send data to each other. But for all that, Kato 3 now offers a better performance. And since the first digit of the version actually increased now, so from Kato 2.x to 3.0, this means that this is also a breaking release. So a release that could possibly break something in your app if you upgrade. But this should actually only bring breaking changes uh, when you really work with these low-level APIs, since that is what is breaking about this, that Kato now works with this Kotlin XIO library. And if you also work with these low-level APIs in your product, then this might be a breaking release, but in most cases, probably not. And that then it's also probably safe to um, migrate. And lastly, Kato 3.0 now also supports WebAssembly. So if you're building a website, then you can now use Kato with that in Kotlin multi-platform. Next up, we have Compose Multiplatform version 1.7.0, which is now out. And the most important changes are on the one hand that the window size class API is now also supported for uh, Kotlin multi-platform or for Compose multi-platform rather. So that's an API or a library that really allows us to easily query for the specific device type or um, screen size that we're on. So if we have layouts that actually vary depending on the screen size, we can easily use this window size class to determine what kind of screen we're on. So a mobile device, maybe tablet, desktop, to just show the right UI for the right type of screen. 
And I think this is especially important for Compose Multi Platform because with that, we are uh, very likely to be working with multiple screen sizes. On Android, well, it could be possible that you work with uh, mobile devices and tablets, but in Compose Multi Platform, you also have the option to actually build something for, uh, for a desktop. So that's quite cool. Then in addition, with the new version 1.7.0, iOS apps are meant to run faster. Then they added drag and drop support for desktop apps with Compose Multiplatform. And lastly, which is really cool, we finally have shared element transitions for Compose Multiplatform apps. So those are the transitions where maybe an image or so from a list item animates to a bigger image on the detail screen. But that's still not it. Regarding Compose and Kotlin Multiplatform, there is another library that is now supported by it. And that is the Saved State API. So I haven't tried this out yet, but this means that we can probably use Saved State Handle in Compose Multi-Platform Project. So if you have a um, Compose Multi-Platform View Model, then you can probably inject a Saved State Handle instance in there. Um, you can probably retrieve the navigation arguments there. You can uh, you also work with this to maybe navigate back and pass arguments that way. So in pure Android apps, I don't want to live without Saved State Handle anymore. Um, so it's very cool that we now also have that in Compose Multiplatform. Going a bit away from Kotlin Multiplatform libraries, still staying at the topic of Kotlin Multiplatform, and that is that JetBrains said that they are apparently working on a standalone IDE for Kotlin Multiplatform development. This IDE is based on Fleet, but it's really its own IDE, where they did not share that many details yet, um, but a few goals they actually shared that they have with this new um, standalone IDE. On the one hand, they want to prevent developers working with Kotlin Multiplatform having to switch between IDEs, so mainly between Android Studio and Xcode. If we actually work with Compose Multiplatform, then that wasn't necessary that much anyways. Sometimes you had to work with Xcode, like if you um, had to change some system config of your app, like um, what we have in the, in the Android manifest on Android, there's also a similar file for iOS. Like if you need to change the minimum SDK for iOS and so on, then you had to work with Xcode. But other than that, for the, for the actual code that you write, you didn't have to leave Android Studio even now. But I still think that is very cool that JetBrains works on this standalone IDE because Xcode is quite trash. Another goal of this IDE is that they um, just want to improve the language support for both Kotlin and Swift. And overall, just to improve the workflow so that both native iOS developers, Kotlin multi-platform developers, Android developers feel at home in this IDE and um, feel productive. And I think in future, this could especially become really interesting in regards to tooling. Since tooling is usually one of the weak points of these typical cross and multi-platform frameworks. So when it comes to things like debugging, for example, native apps were always superior. It's always a pain having to debug a uh, native iOS code that is generated from Kotlin multi-platform code. So I really hope that this will also be improved with this IDE. What JetBrains is also working on is Kotlin to Swift exports. Because right now this is only possible with Objective-C as a middleman, so that Kotlin code is transformed to Objective-C code, which is then transformed to Swift code. But they're also apparently working on a solution that will directly take the Kotlin code and transform it to Swift code. And the last news, not for this video, but in regards to JetBrains is that they still have big plans for their Amper build system. So Amper is a build tool from JetBrains that they're working on that will help us to um, just configure the builds for our projects, specifically probably Kotlin multi-platform projects. This build tool is based on Gradle, so it uses Gradle as the backend, but configuring it works via YAML files. So for example, like this. I personally don't have an impression of it yet, so I can't say a lot about it. But as we know, Gradle can be a pain. And yes, this Amper system still uses Gradle, but configuring it works with YAML files. And I think there will be a reason that, they are, that they're actually building this build system, because apparently it should become easier to configure your builds that way. So I assume that a lot of Gradle's complexity will be abstracted away from us there, and we can then really focus on what matters, and ideally having a less error-prone build mechanism and build config but only the future will tell. Okay, you're leaving the JetBrains ecosystem and diving into the Android ecosystem for a moment because there's also a new Jetpack library out there for Android and that is the Ink API. So this is a new stylus API that Google just released. So if you have a pen for your tablet, then you can use this new API to actually let users write something in your app, like handwritten, uh, you can let them draw something. So if you're building an app that goes in that direction that could use a stylus, then you now have a ready-made library from Google that will help you with that. So far, it seems that this library is not available for Compose Multi-Platform yet, but as all uh, Jetpack libraries, we can probably expect this to also be available for uh, Compose Multi-Platform in future. 
And lastly, which is probably the most important news here, um, which is why I already made a separate video about that, is the lawsuit between Epic Games and Google. The first round of that actually came to an end. So Epic Games, the, the makers of Fortnite, had a big lawsuit against Google. And it was all about Google having to open up their uh, Google Play Store to also allow other, other third-party app stores to be installed from there, to be advertised from there. It was about that Google shouldn't be allowed anymore to charge 30% of fees on every single transaction made by an app installed from Google Play. And the US court now decided about that, which was heavily in favor of Epic Games. So it's quite likely that uh, huge changes to Google Play, to their policies will come, um, that we will see more third-party app stores with less fees, with a better review process maybe. But Google still has the chance and also will appeal to this. So another court will look at it um, and then the future will show in which direction this lawsuit will go. I already talked about that in detail, what this means for us and our developers in a video that I will also link down below. And that's it, we're through. I think this was a really cool episode of Android News, a lot of cool changes. So thank you for watching. As I said, you'll also find um, the link for the Mobile Dev Campus down below. So if you want to participate at monthly coding challenges, be rewarded for that, win actual money for that. Connect with me, my team, with other cool Android developers, then uh, check that out. Because until Sunday, you can still get the early bird discount, then the price will rise and it will never be cheaper than right now. Thanks, enjoy, and I'll see you back in the next video. Have an amazing rest of your week. Bye-bye. <laughs>